inviting me again. When I came here in 2018 and uh, uh, did my, my talk, the, the slides kind of had a mind of their own and they whipped all over the place and it was, I thought, oh, that's it, I've made such a mess of the story. It was about two soldiers in love in uh, Shropshire in uh, the Second World War and I thought, oh dear, that's terrible. But anyway, thank you, I'm back. <laughs> so I'm Peter Roscoe. I'm from uh, Macclesfield in Cheshire, um, and I live now in Shrewsbury, lived most of my life in Shrewsbury, in Shropshire, which is a county which is on the border of North Wales. Um, I'm gay, I was born in 1952, so I was 15 when the 67 Act went through, so not a lot of help to me because, as you know, it was a limited reform, huge step forward, wonderful, but I was, you know, uh, six years off it uh, being of even slight help to me. I love history festivals, I think they're great, and I thought what Chris said was just so wonderful because I have come across the same things locally in Shropshire, trying to dig up stories of well-known, or not so well-known, unknown Shropshire folk. And yes, you get asked, what's your evidence? You know, well, I don't have a video of them at, at it, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I found a few, and I'll just mention one. The last one I did was a wonderful woman, because um, I think it's really good to find strong women, strong role models. A woman called Eglantine Jeb, who was born in Ellesmere in uh, Shropshire. And uh, in 1919, um, Eglantine, whose uh, girlfriend was called Margaret um, uh, Keynes, um, in 1919 she was so horrified at what was happening in post-war uh, Austria and Germany in the reparations, uh, something had to be done, and she was one of the few people who managed to unite the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury and get a campaign going and set up the Save the Children Fund. Wonderful <coughs> woman from Ellesmere in Shropshire. Wonderful strong lesbian. Wonderful. I was so pleased. But we had those same hurdles as prove it, etc., etc. But there are letters. <laughs> <laughs> so this year I thought, yes, I'd like to do another. But I thought, well, maybe I'll do something different. I'll find an ally. Somebody has to be connected with Shropshire. So you might be very surprised if I were to say that Mary Whitehouse, who some of you will know of, some of you won't, was a lesbian. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. No, she most definitely was not a lesbian. So thank goodness for that. But for, you, for those, of, for many of you, I think you do. The name resonates probably in a horrible way for you. For those of you who don't know who Mary Whitehouse was. She really got going in the 1960s through to the 1990s. She was a powerhouse campaigning against what she saw as pornography, violence, um, blasphemy, etc., etc. And uh, her starting point was BBC television in the 1960s. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, Shropshire Connection, she was a teacher there at a pivotal time in her life in the 60s. 61 to 64, she taught at Maisley Modern School. And um, a key event in relation to our history was her prosecution of gay news in 1976 under blasphemy law. Um, and that was prosecution, as I say, of gay news. And uh, it was a poem called The Love That Dares uh, to Speak Its Name. I'll tell you more about that in a minute or so. A few credits. Wonderful book, Ban This Filth by Ben Thompson. If you want to know more, that's the best way in. He's really done a great job. And I have no shame in saying some of the thoughts come from Ben, uh, ben Thompson. Also, thank you to the um, Albert Sloman Archive at the University of Essex, uh, where I went uh, myself. I went there because it was as far away from Macclesfield as you could get. And also, I had a Liberation Front Society, 1970. Ooh. Um, wonderful archive there of Mary's stuff, thousands and thousands of documents, hundreds and hundreds of bo uh, boxes. Um, quite nerve-wracking in a way because a lot of that contains so much bigotry and hatred towards us. I thought I need a sort of a counselling station here as I'm piling through it because you read one after another. Anyway, she didn't, I would say, specifically target LGBTQ queer people, um, but her view of us, I think, was thoroughly homophobic. And um, uh, there she is, just to remind you how she looked. 
Um, and if you'd like to hear her as well. Oh, definitely. Yes, somebody, this is a look from 1980s, just to give you a little, si si uh, little snapshot of uh, really her view of what she was calling then the gay lib. Those gay magazines sold in, in Smith's and some other news agents and, uh, and corner shops, it isn't who buys them. It's them what it's like pornography. It's what happens after they're bought. Who are they handed to? Going into the schools, for instance. I mean, the adolescent children go through what the psychologists call the homosexual phase. The one area where I have spoken out against homosexual practices of a different kind is are the activities of those who go into the schools and say to young people going through that period of turmoil and uncertainty, they're glad to be gay. Now that I find a form of exploitation. The <laughs> and you know, the number of times I had to play that to try and get it to fit on the slide and failed at the end even. So I've got that, that's really those magazines. <laughs> ah, dreadful, horrible. Um, and I was in my teens when she was coming out with that sort of crap, you know, as a background. And some of my aunties were like Mary, and they thought she was the best thing since sliced bread. So it was tricky. Um, brief biography, born in 1910 in Nuneaton, same year as my dad, so very much the older generation for me. Childhood in Chester, um, lower middle class sort of family, I guess. Um, she was the second child. She had uh, older sisters and two younger brothers. And actually her passion as a child was tennis. And unfortunately, I else probably, her dad didn't have enough money to encourage that because she probably would have got to Wimbledon. So just think, she could have been a mentor for Margaret Court. <laughs> could that have got worse or not? Anyway, that didn't happen. She went to, to become a teacher. She was a frustrated artist. She trained in art and in secondary education. And her first job was at a very poor school in uh, the West Midlands in Wensfield. Um, she wasn't then particularly a religious woman, um, not particularly bothered. And at that time, roughly, she had an affair with a, a married man. I know. <laughs> uh, I don't think there was any sex, but she had an affair with <laughs> <laughs> them. She, she was very conflicted. So she's conflicted, she's teaching in a poor school, first job, all the rest of it. And unfortunately, a friend said, oh, Mary, come along to a meeting at Wolverhampton YMCA. It's a group called the Oxford Group. Now, the Oxford Group was set up at the turn of the 20th century, I think, evangelical Christian organization, and it lit a candle for her. Ah, a solution to her dilemmas and distresses. And not long after that, the Oxford Group merged into an organisation that became known as Moral Rearmament, which some of you may have heard about. I'll say a little bit more about that, but again, another very narrow evangelical Christian organisation. And through that, she met her husband, Ernest, and uh, they married in 1940. She had five children and fostered one girl, who I think she adopted as well, a niece. Um, I should just say, it was five boys, but she had twins. She knew early on in the pregnancy that the twins were not going to survive. She was advised strongly to have an abortion. She wouldn't, and uh, went to full term. The babies died very, very immediately after birth. So trauma in her, her, in her life. Her first public appearance, which gave me a bit of a resonance with uh, Eglantine, was um, at uh, Wolverhampton Town Hall in 1945, um, when she was appalled by what was happening to the German civilian population in Germany after World War II. And she was raising a campaign to raise money uh, for that. So I thought, was that an interesting coincidence with Eglantine and Mary? That's about as close as they ever get. <laughs> um, so really, it, it's Mary from the mid-60s and her 35-year career that probably most of you will, will, or many of you will know about. Uh, she got the CBE in 1980, Wonderful for her, Margaret Thatcher got in in 1979. She died in Essex in 2001. Um, key life transition, as I've said earlier, was in 1963 when Thompson, in this book, says she moves from being teacher to what he calls a Christian performance act. <laughs> and it, boy, was it an act. Um, Bane of my teenager years, 
Um, her mantra really was, you know, you've heard of these, chastity and fidelity. So her way of looking at things was a little bit like, uh, perhaps you might say, some of the African bishops today, or the evangelical speakers in the United States. Underlying it are a, a, a sort of a thick strand of homophobia, always. And um, the earliest record I found of that, of her view on homosexuality, was this article from 1953. And just to read um, the first paragraph of it, uh, she says, it may seem a strange thing that a woman should write about homosexuality, but I think many mothers suffer from the fear that through no fault of their own, their boys may be tempted or warped. <laughs> Incidentally, of course, lesbians were not on her mindset. <laughs> Homosexuals is, is, is uh, you dirty queer men. Moreover, I believe that in the last resort, it will be in the homes of the world that an answer to this problem will be found. For one of the main causes of sexual inversion is an unhealthy relationship between mother and son. So, um, that was her view. Now, why would Mary in 1953 be writing an article in the Sunday Times about homosexuality? I mean, quite groundbreaking if you think about it. The context of the time. Um, what was going on? Well, I think things were happening in the press. There were famous people uh, being reported who were either being taken through the courts, exposed. Peter Wildblood comes to mind, Lord Montague. Uh, Michael Pick Rivers, some of these names you may know of. And of course, it was just before the Wolfenden Report, or not the report, but the committee that led to the report in 57. So I think these things were bubbling around, and she obviously even then had a little poke. And remember, she's got moral rearmament probably helping her along the way. What propelled her um, onto the uh, Christian Performance Act? Um, She's in the 20s, remember, in moral rearmament. But I think the next key thing that happened in her life, and in the life of the country too, was the Profumo scandal, 1963. Now, some of you may have seen the televised thing, Profumo, recently. And we could lay the blame for Mary's trajectory on the girls at Mainly Modern School in Shropshire. Profumo, for those who may not be aware, Profumo was a senior minister in the Macmillan government. And in 1961, he was having a high old time with Christine Keeler um, and Mandy Weiss Davis and others. And it sort of came to light. He was questioned and he stood up in Parliament and he totally denied it. Not happening. So in those days, certainly, if a gentleman stood in the Houses of Parliament and said he was not guilty of what scurrilous rumours were, he was believed. It kept coming, trickle, trickle. 63, he had to admit to it. He resigned, spent the rest of his life working for, uh, I think, the Toynbee House charity in East London, did some very good work uh, after that. But one thing Profumo did was, people have said, people started to talk about sex in a way that we had not done so probably since the Second World War. And what I think really upset um, Mary was the response of some of the girls that made me modern, because some of them were saying, well, you know, there's Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis. They're going out with these rich old gentlemen. They're having champagne. They're going in lovely swimming pools. They're going to, you know, big stately homes, having a high old time. Seems quite a good idea to us. <laughs> <laughs> and she thought, something is really rotten here, that these girls could even begin to think that. Um, and I did get in touch with um, some of her girls from Maidly Modern, who are now kind of around, well, the early 70s, I would say. So I'll just read you a couple of their responses. There's a local site, you probably have them here, it's called Telford Memories. And one of them says, um, Handel's Messiah every Friday at the full assembly, you can see her now tapping her feet. Strict but fair, had a parade, but had a parade uh, out past her, and were we tied if your skirt was too short. Rolled over at the waist, and if your shoes were not clean, off you went to her room where she had polishing brushes and made you clean them. She was very strict, as if this is another one. I had my skirt rolled over as it was too long, and my mom hadn't had time to take it up. She yanked it right down. It wasn't short, but she still yanked it. Also, I back combed my hair a bit, then she took me in her room and got a comb and got my back comb out, and she pulled my hair out and left a ball patch at the back of my head. She wasn't at all nice. Now, those are the two most complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you what some of the others are. 
Um, but yeah, not, not nice. I'll return to that as well. Um, so anyway, she saw this moral disintegration and uh, she felt it was very much being fed what was coming into everybody's living rooms through the telly, particularly the BBC. So in 1964, in January, she um, launched a uh, publication for the Clean Up TV campaign and started getting people to fill out monitoring forms where you would sit by your telly and you'd have your little boxes and you would record blasphemy, violence, nudity. There's a lovely little um, YouTube video clip of a couple settling down with a cup of tea and uh, they've got the telly on. I think it's Zed Cars, which was um, a drama about police and um, patrol car, um, which I quite enjoyed. And um, you can see them go, oh yes, I think, yeah, that's a blasphemy, darling. <laughs> yes, and uh, oh, what? Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's nudity. <laughs> and one of the records was uh, an episode of a, a comedy called Till Death Has Depart. Um, Alf Garnett, so again, some of you will remember, and that had 103 bloodies in it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that chef today? You know, who does all the swearing? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so. There we are, Clean Up TV campaign, 5th of uh, May 1964, was launched in Birmingham Town Hall, attended by 2,000, including schoolgirls in uniform. And who was it was going on about exploitation? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, rapid growth, she touched an earth, lots of people were writing to her, and a uh, very, very successful campaign um, captured the, uh, she would say, captured the nation's imagination. And uh, a year on from that, we can see her, that's Ernest and Mary and uh, Nora Buckland and her husband, the Reverend Buckland from Staffordshire, who were the main drivers of the uh, Clean Up TV campaign. And uh, she obviously couldn't sustain this rapidly growing movement with her teaching, so she retired. And uh, thousands of letters being sent to her. This is just one from a woman in Belfast, Clive asking for one of the forms that I've described to you. Um, that's a fairly nice letter, as I say. Some of the, many of them I read were, were pretty horrendous content, and sadly, so many of them signed Reverend. It just, oh. Very homespun. Um, that's as she moves from Clean Up TV campaign into the National Viewers and Listeners um, Association. N Valor, it sounds like a Nordic sort of cry, doesn't it? Um, now, N Valor at its height had 150,000 members, and its initial target was the Director General of the BBC, a chap called Hugh Green, who I think was a pretty, pretty good bloke. Is my voice going up and down? Is it all right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, he, I thought, was a, a good influence on the BBC, 60s into the 70s. He was a chap who had been at the liberation of Auschwitz um, and he, as Mary was trying to tap him on the shoulder, he was shutting the door on her because he saw where totalitarianism takes you and wanted nothing to do with her. So bizarrely, you've got somebody who's trying to say, I want a voice here, and he censored her. But maybe he was right, that's something we can talk about. Um, he wanted nothing to do with her. And... Um, yeah, I think it was good. Wednesday play, all sorts of dramas, comedies came into the television. Good stuff. Her campaigns widened as we get into the 70s, from out of TV into plays, film, and then taking on the porn, porn industry itself. Um, one of the plays, just to mention, was Romans in Britain. Um, that was the play that was on at the National Theatre. Mm. And she persuaded the state to do a prosecution under the... Um, same law that uh, brought uh, Oscar Wilde down in 1895, procuring an act of gross indecency, because in the first scene, it, it's an allegory of um, the Romans uh, coming in and raping Britain, and in the first scene there's a, 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 an allegory of, of the, the British in Northern Ireland, I should say. So it was, the play was playing with that idea, and at the beginning there is a rape scene of a, a Roman centurion in an ancient Britain. Uh, so she got the state to prosecute her. The state's sole witness was Mary's solicitor, who was sitting 90 feet from the stage and claimed he could see an erection happening. 
um, when it's pointed out, actors are very clever people, and it was a carefully lit and placed film. <laughs> and the prosecution collapsed, so that was a failure for her. But she was very clumsy at the beginning, as you can see from this, quite, uh, quite you know, um, amateurish, but she became very slick in using the media, the courts, and politicians. Uh, and she had established links with the um, Festival of Light, who you may have heard of, Malcolm Marguerite, Cliff Richard, similar sort of movement. Um, as she's building into the 60s and 70s, I think it's interesting to contrast the way in which people fought back against her. Um, on the one hand, you have the example of the Gay Liberation Front, who at the launch of Festival of Light on the 9th of September 1971, I think did some stunning stuff because they had a mole in the Festival of Light organisation, so they knew what the programme was. Um, and uh, there's a, a wonderful bloke called Betty Bourne, who's made a film called It Goes With The Shoes. Do look it, look it up. But what they did was, at certain choreographed points and signals in the hall, they sort of went in looking like good, normal, heterosexual people. Sorry for any insult there, but you know what I'm trying to say. And the pre-arranged signals, like one group would stand up and would shout, filth, filth, it's filth, and would throw pornography into the arena. And the other people around me would go, oh. And then, sort of when they tweet, hang on a minute, and then a group of nuns would rise on roller skates and throw it across. Fantastic. Um, but contrast that with the way she was attacked by the porn industry who set up a, a porn magazine called White House. <laughs> and I remember at the time seeing that on the top shelf and thinking, oh, that's that woman, that's Mary what does it? Yeah, I didn't twig. It was their way of getting back at her. The tabloids who tried to set up uh, her, two, her three sons in compromising situations, you know, they'd be invited to parties and then, hey, they were there with the cameras. It didn't work. But the sad thing for me was my sort of hero up to this point of Hugh Green, um, who'd purchased a painting by Isherwood. Now, I can understand he would detest Mary. Um, Isherwood was an artist who was very much against censorship. Um, but this is the painting that uh, Hugh Green purchased. <laughs> and to make it worse, he used to throw, uh, Hugh Green used to throw darts at it, apparently. But you see, the whole thing was very, the attacks on her were, were, were you know, stupid woman, um, bitch, and worse, misogynist, sexist. Anyway, for all GLF's fun at the Festival of Life, she got her own back um, in 1976. When in this edition of Gay News, which hadn't been going very long, and remember this was, Gay News was tremendously important in our development as a, a rallying point, a, you know, other than a porn magazine or anything, it was a, a place for discussion, for community. They chose to publish a poem, as I mentioned earlier, by a chap called James Kirkup. Um, now, this poem is a scurrilous poem. Um, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, there was that. <laughs> um, it was really, the poem, anyway, was referred to Mary anonymously. Uh, she always uh, um, claims uh, that's how it happened, and the author of the book, Thompson, said she would have acted even if this poem had been published in the Angling Times. Why the Angling Times would publish such a poem, I have no idea. But she couldn't persuade the state to make a prosecution, so she went to the common law of blasphemy. And the judge um, in the case, said, uh, in a blasphemy case, um, wider interests of the merits of the poem in literature, arguments about freedom of speech are of no concern. We're just looking at, find the words here. Is it a publication of material that exposes the Christian religion to scurrility, vilification, ridicule and contempt? And is it material that must have the tendency to shock and outrage the feelings of Christians? That is the common law. So they had a whole line of eminent literature people to speak, and they were all just not heard. Only two character witnesses were allowed. And of course it does have it did have huge implications for freedom of speech and publication. Um, and I'll tell you what it's about. Uh, the poem is about a Roman centurion 
Um, Jesus is on the cross, dead. His body is brought down, and for a while the centurion is um, uh, ruminating on his love for Jesus and the sex they've had together, and the sex that they've all had together, he and all the disciples, and then goes even further to that, and he um, makes love to the dead body of Christ. So there you go. So that kind of fits really comfortable. Uh, Dennis Lemon, the editor at the time, was uh, uh, given a suspended prison sentence of nine months and fined £500. Gay News was um, fined uh, £1,000. This is on, the, on my birthday when I'm 25. Appeal, the appeal was, was dismissed, House of Lords dismissed, um, nine months um, was quashed. Now, I, I did hesitate to show you the poem because although the law was um, repealed in England and Wales in 2008, and it was repealed in the Republic of Ireland, I think just in January, it's still the law here in Northern Ireland. So, hey, I'm going to push the button. <laughs> Whoa. Because <laughs> I'm a scaredy cat. But also, I don't believe in, in just launching a campaign without collectively working with other people. I did contact the humanists of Northern Ireland who launched a campaign and had a demonstration in Belfast last September, um, but we weren't able to make links. And I don't see the point in making pointless gest gestures. I might have had more courage if it had been a beautiful poem. But it's actually a rubbish poem, <laughs> really, really icky poem. Um, so there you go. Um, it did generate lots of anger in our community, and I have thought, why did they put that poem in? Um, and I think it was, uh, James Kirk, I think, was very young. He distanced himself immediately from the poem and said, I was an adolescent, I was angry, um, I never thought it would ever be published, and disappeared to Andorra, and I uh, just got angry about what he saw as the politicisation of the whole thing. Um, and I have checked, I don't know the Bible that well, but apart from, I think, in one place, there is a bit where Jesus gives some advice to the centurion about his relationship with his servant. There's no basis for the whole um, mucky story that Kirk up created. Um, so there's lots of anger here. Um, when she went to Australia shortly after this all happened, she was met with huge anger and got a pie pushed in her face. Um, here we had campaigning, that's one of the buttons from the time, um, some more. And demonstration, uh, 5,000 people in 1977 uh, in London. Um, that's my partner, Jeff, on the right, and we call them allies now, but we didn't know but our friends, uh, Fred and uh, Rachel, on the side there. Um, what happened? Well, of course, every cloud has a silver lining. It pulled us all together. Um, gays, lesbians, straights, it was a unification. So, you know, it's by Section 28. We, we kick back, we go forward. Um, circulation of gay news jumped from 8,000 before the prosecution to 40,000. Um, so it wasn't all bad, but it was a bad time generally, you know, a low point. Having said that, I then came across the argument that maybe Mary Whitehouse, so in a way, was a sort of a gay icon. Because if you think about it, she's very camp um, and very engaging when you see her. And uh, she's the butt of jokes, and you never know whether she quite gets that she's the butt of jokes or whether she just takes it very well. And she loved the Dame Edna experience. She loved being on the Dame Edna. And she had plaudits in Jeremy Paxman, Richard Neville, who was of the old underground newspaper, Mick Jagger, others who took a shine to Mary. And then I started thinking, yeah, I remember the, the, the young women at Maybelline Modern. She was really trying to, wasn't she trying to give a message about the exploitation of young women? You know, you don't need to have your little mini skirts on. You don't need to have your body exposed in a sexually explicit way. You can do something else. Of course, her other way was very much traditional model of mother and wife. So, but then I thought, well, maybe. But then I remember, what were her roots? Moral rearmament, for goodness sakes. Moral rearmament, when she was in her 20s, 
um, the leader of the moral realm and went to the 1936 uh, Nazi Olympics and um, said that the, um, what the Nazis were doing was a good thing. Uh, he thought it was good. Get rid of the communists for a start. The other thing is that they bought the whole Cold War story, um, being that the Soviets were out to undermine our society and one way through was to undermine our culture and that uh, they were there as intellectuals in the BBC uh, and spies beavering away and uh, putting on things like there was a, a film called The War Game. I don't know if you remember that, Tom Watkins. It was about what would happen if a nuclear bomb was dropped on, on the country, uh, which the BBC had to censor. They didn't show it. She was very pleased about that. Uh, Dimbleby did get on a programme about so people coming out of Belson. Um, she was appalled by that. And the reasons why she said these have been deliberately put on to sap the will of our young men. Our young men will not fight. This is just the Soviets trickling through to stop the strength of our country and ultimately the destruction of Christianity. Um, she was a populist. You could say maybe she was akin to today's who? Nigel Farage, Anne Widdicombe, Donald Trump, Katie Hopkins. Very persuasive, you know, this whole thing of, it's common sense, isn't it? Common sense, there's no need for evidence. Don't give us evidence, intellectual study. She's the voice of ordinary folk. Um, and it's a common thing, isn't it, in our history, is um, the, uh, the rise of people like Mary Whitehouse and others. Um, why this happens is a, a bigger question, really. Um, it was certainly very bad for me growing up having someone like Mary in the wings. She had no insight at all. Um, and the other thing that really made me think she had no care for LGBT people was, in, remember the uh, article from 1953? Well, because of that, she was contacted in 1954 by the BBC, who wanted to put on a programme about homosexuality. And uh, we don't have the reply, um, but we do have, um, we do have uh, some notes. And one of the notes, she appears to describe us, queer people, as an excrescence. Now, an excrescence is a, an outgrowth or a deformity um, in nature. And the way you deal with that is you, you cut it out. Um, now, her view was that uh, there was a cure for homosexuality, and in 60% of cases it was successful. Don't go where the 40% would go. Um, the other thing is, she failed in her own terms, I think, because again, going back to that early article from 53, um, her two younger sons, um, when talking to the papers, there was a play on about Mary called, uh, I think it's called Filth, the Mary Whitehouse story in 2008, and these sons were interviewed. They would be in their late 70s now. And they just said, it was horrible for us as teenagers. She was never there for us. She was off on her track. And the younger son uh, had been estranged for, from her for 15 years before she died. Um, he just said there was no other way through, and she hadn't changed. She was not a lady for turning. Um, I'll leave you with a, a little paradox at the end I found. Um, she died in, as I say, 2001 in a care home in Dedham in Essex. And when I was talking to the curator at the Mary Whitehouse Archive at the University of Essex. He said one thing that he noticed on the, the wall of her room in her residential care home was a portrait of Dame Edward Everidge. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? And I don't know which one it was, but <coughs> maybe it was that one. <laughs> I don't know. So an interesting character. I'm glad she failed and fell so badly. And going back to that little recording of her voice, I'm so pleased that those brave gay teachers that then became Schools Out, that has now become this movement for LGBT history, did go into those schools and continue to go into those schools because we would not be where we are today without that work and along the way dealing with, with people like Mary Whitehouse. So, Hope that's been interesting. Thank you for being such an attentive audience. It's been lovely to be here. Thanks a lot.
I've run the time for questions.